All right. So, well, good evening or good morning, depending on where you are right now. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation. And today I'm going to talk with you about neural networks, but from a very different perspective. Namely, I'm going to show you how tools that are conventionally used in operations research, such as polyhedral theory and integer programming, can be used to understand what neural networks can represent. And also, help can, they can help us understand how to make these neural networks smaller. And the work that I'm presenting here today is based on a sequence of papers that are joint work with Abhinav Kumar from Michigan State University, Sri Kumar Maligan from Google Research and the University of Utah, and Christian Jihad Madraja, who is currently at Google Research. So for the past, I'm sorry, for the past 10 to 15 years, we have seen deep learning being successfully used as a tool for predictive modeling. And the way that it works, at least in feed forward neural networks, is that you have a sequence of layers that successfully transform an input all the way to supposedly obtain a prediction. In this example here, which is like a silly example, but it's very commonly used, we have a picture and we're trying to tell whether there is a cat or a dog in the picture. So we're going to send um, the representation of this picture and the numerical representation of this picture through the neural network. And as it goes through the layers and it's successfully transformed, we're supposedly obtaining a prediction of whether there is a cat or a dog there. Now, in every one of these layers, we have, um, we have uh, neurons, uh, each one of these dots here, that they mimic to a certain extent what a biological neuron would do in that they observe their inputs and certain inputs will activate them and make them produce a corresponding output. For example, these black dots here, they're not being activated by the picture, but this white dot here is. So this white dot is sending some signal forward, which is read by the neurons in the next layer. In the next layer, some neurons will, be act will not be activated but by what they're observing, and some others will. And in this way, they're identifying features and trying to understand what exactly is in the picture. And the way that we train a neural network for a particular task is that we adjust when each one of these neurons is going to react and what's the intensity of the reaction when they do. Now, this is all very nice, all very neat, but there are many situations in which these things simply don't work. I mean, we, we, we define a neural network with a particular architecture, but for this one application we have in mind, it simply doesn't produce the results we're hoping for. And at this point, we don't have a unifying theory that can tell us when uh, neural networks are likely to perform well in a particular task or not. And part of the work that I'm presenting here today is aimed at coming up with a theory that could explain that to a certain extent. So in this talk, we're going to think about feed-forward neural networks. Those are neural networks where you have this input going through the neural network. Uh, like you don't have any sort of like um, connections going backwards. And this is basically representing a mapping from an input space X, which is here on top, to the output space Y, which here is on the bottom. But there's a little bit more that we have to talk about the architecture. So we're going to use capital L for the number of layers of the neural network, NL as the width of a layer. So that's the number of neurons in a particular layer L. And the output of a layer is going to be this vector HL. HL will have as many dimensions as the width, because basically every neuron is producing a one-dimensional output. It's a scalar. When we put all of them together, we have a vector. And then without loss of generality, so like the output of the first layer is H1, second layer H2, and so on. So just to make things easier, we can talk about the input X as actually H0. And we can talk about the dimension of the input in the same way we talk about the width of the layers. So if the width of layer one is N1, let's say that the dimension of the input, which is the dimension of X, is N0. Now, this is just some basic 
introduction to like uh, the main notation that we're going to use, but I'm not expecting you to like keep all of this in mind all the time. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on rectifier networks. Those are the most commonly type, uh, sorry, let me restart that. So in this talk, we're going to concentrate on rectifier networks. Those are neural networks where we only use rectified linear units or ReLUs. And a ReLU is the most commonly used type of neuron in neural networks. That's why it's very important to be studied more extensively. And since we're in a feedforward neural network, what happens here is that every neuron is going to observe all the inputs coming, all the outputs coming from the previous layer. And the neuron is going to produce an output that goes to all the neurons in the next layer. And this mathematical formula um, between inputs and outputs is given as said as, as in this slide right now. So the output equals the maximum of zero and an affine function. And so this W and these Bs that are here, like the weights and the bias, they are the parameters that are just when we train a neural network for a particular task. And then when we take the maximum between these two, we're incurring that the neural network has a nonlinear behavior. Depending on what comes in, you might have a zero coming out or you, have, or you might have an affine function of the inputs coming out. But we, that really depends on the case. Now, when the output is zero, which means that the maximum between these two terms is the first one, we say, it, uh, remembering about that analogy with um, biological neurons, we can say that the ReLU is inactive. Now, when the output is given by the affine transformation, which means that the output is positive, then we can say that the ReLU is active. So basically, the ReLU is this maximum between zero and affine, uh, and like this affine transformation of the inputs, which is common in all neural networks. And by adding this nonlinearity, this maximum between two terms, we're making the function more complex. And what's interesting about the ReLU, and in fact, about any neural network in which you use piecewise near functions as the activation functions like the ReLU, or for example, leaky ReLU or max out, is that when you put all of these neurons together, because each neuron is defining a piecewise linear function, the entire neural network in the end will also define a piecewise linear function. Which brings us to something very interesting about this neuro neural network with ReLUs, which is we're Whenever we're training a neural network that only has ReLUs or other piecewise linear activations, we're basically performing a piecewise linear regression. There's, for example, there's a linear regression, which is just one slope, and the piecewise linear regression is just a combination of slopes. So, so far, so good. So, I mean, that gives us a simpler explanation of what exactly is being trained, what are these functions that are being produced by the neural network. And as you can see in the picture here on the top, on the left, we have three slopes. On the right, we have five slopes. So it's a, on the right, we have a picture. We have like a function with more pieces. And we may wonder, OK, maybe having more pieces is better because we can do a better fit of the training data. And potentially, this will perform well in practice, give us a better accuracy. But there are some puzzling things here that we are, we're going to explore here. And like not all of them are fully answered. The first one is. Once you set this architecture for your neural network, we don't fully understand what's the family of piecewise in your functions that you can get. We have some understanding of that, but it's not perfect. And the second one, and this is also very important in practice, is, OK, I'm training a neural network. I don't know exactly what piecewise in your functions I can get out of it. I know I can get some, and but maybe uh, this neural network is simply too large for the applications that I have in mind. Maybe I want to embed this in a in a cell phone or like some like on some other device that is even, even simpler te technologically. And you may wonder, is it possible that the same function could be represented by a neural network that that is smaller? So that's that's another question that's very important for us. And we're going to look at each one of these questions at a time. And in terms of uh, and in terms of terminology going forward, when I'm talking about pieces of these functions, these different slopes, this is what we call a linear region. It's a part of the input space uh, in which the the neural network has a linear behavior. 
a constant linear behavior. So with that, we have our introduction set in. Now, what we're going to do is look at the first part of the talk, which is what makes neural networks so expressive? So in order to talk about the number of these linear regions in the functions defined by a neural network, we are going to talk about activation patterns. Let's say that you have some input X and you send X through the neural network. So that will activate some neurons in the first layer that will be the activation set of the first layer. And the, the outputs coming out of these neurons will activate other neurons in the second layer and other neurons in the third and in the fourth. So we're going to have these activation sets for each one of the, la the layers. And when we put them all together, this is what we're going to call an activation pattern. It's basically a signature of which neurons are on and which neurons are off when you send a particular input through the neural network. So that's basically what happens when you send one input. But now let's think backwards about that. For a particular signature, we can think about a linear region as the set of all points that if you send one of them through the neural network, you're going to activate exactly the same neurons. And it turns out this, this is going to be a convex set. These points will be all together, which is very convenient for us. And once, since we're characterizing the linear regions in terms of activation patterns, and it's basically an on and off for every one of the neurons in the neural network, you can imagine that, OK, so the maximum number of linear regions that you can define consists of every possible pattern, right? Which brings us to this first upper bound on the number of linear regions, which, which is true, elevated to the number of neurons across the entire neural network, which basically says, OK, if I have a neural network with 10 neurons, I will have at most 1,024 linear regions. If I have 20 neurons, that will be about a million linear regions, and so on. Now, if that was it, I wouldn't be here giving this talk. So what we have to understand here is that the shape of the neural network will have a strong effect on the actual number of linear regions that we will get in practice, which might be a lot smaller than this bound that we just discussed here. And why do we care about these things? So negatives through these bounds are very important. So if we can find a tighter bound for, OK, depending on the, on the number of layers and the width of the layers of the neural network, I'm going to tell you that you can't, find, you, you can't express more complex functions. Knowing that is important because that tells you, um, we, because with that, you can know what functions cannot be approximated by a particular architecture of the neural network. And also, this allows us to compare different configurations. We might be wondering about what's the right way to, to create the architecture, like what are the right hyperparameters for us. Just to give you an example, and this is something we're going to cover by the end of this part of the talk. Let's say that we have a neural network um, with three layers. The, th the third layer is the output. And we have these two architectures here. In the first two layers, in the two cases here, we have a total of 22 units. But, but, but on the left, we have 18 neurons in the first layer and four in the second. On the right, we have four neurons in the first layer and 18 in the second. We're just flipping the width of the two hidden layers of the neural network. And you may wonder, OK, this potentially doesn't have any strong effects, but it turns out that the average number of linear regions for this configuration on the left, 18, 4, 10, is orders of magnitude larger than the maximum number of linear regions that you can ever obtain with the configuration on the right, 4, 18, and 10. So, and what we're going to do in this talk is show you analytically why that's so, is that so, and also give you some intuition for why different uh, alterations in the widths across the neural network might have this effect. So stay with me, and you're going to understand why that's so. Now, if we're going to talk about more precise bounds mm -hmm. for this number of linear regions to understand what we can represent and which neural networks are more likely to be used for in practice, we will need some extra tools now. We have to understand the geometry of these linear regions. 
So the first thing that we're going to talk about here to get there is what we call an activation hyperplane. So as I mentioned to you, the output of the neuron is giving us the maximum of zero and that affine function on the inputs. Now, if you pick this affine function, the W times the H of the input plus the bias equal, uh, and if you, if you equal that to zero, this is defining a hyperplane. And it's a very special hyperplane for us because we know that in, on one side of this hyperplane, we have points that activate the neuron. And on the other side of the hyperplane, including the hyperplane itself, we have points that do not activate the neuron. They produce a negative output for the affine function, which means that the ReLU is going to spit a zero output. So, which basically means that we're breaking like every neuron, um, every neuron is going to break the inputs into one half space where the neuron is active and one half space in which the neuron is not active. Now, that's just for one neuron. Now, what happens when we put the hyperplanes of all the neurons in the same layer together is that we are going to get a hyperplane arrangement. Basically, every full dimensional region produced by this uh, just a position of all the hyperplanes is going to correspond to a different linear region. And now, and we have some, some result, geometrical results that tells us that there's a maximum number of full dimensional regions that can be defined when you just put a lot, lots of hyperplanes together. This number depends on two things. It depends on the number of hyperplanes, which is basically the number of neurons in the layer, and it also depends on the dimension of the space. So it's based, for now, we can think about the dimension of the space as the dimension of either the input of the neural network in the first layer or the dimension of the output coming out from the previous layer. But we're going to, we're going to refine that later. Now, if we're talking about shallow networks, that's actually all that we need. Like there is this result called the Soslowski theorem, which is basically uh, implicit by what I'm discussing here, which is going to tell us exactly how many linear regions we can have at most, given a neural network with only one, a shallow, with only one layer, which is what we call a shallow network. In that case, we basically plug this the, uh, the dimension. Let me just get a pen here. We basically plug the dimension, the, the input dimension uh, uh, here on the top of the summation and the number of hyperplanes in the only layer inside the summation. And that's it. Now, if, for example, we have four hyperplanes in two dimensions, which is, okay, let's say I have a neural network with dimension two and have one layer and this layer has four neurons. How many near regions can we get? Well, from what we discussed before, if you have four neurons and there are combinations of on and off, you would expect two elevated to four, which is 16. But actually, you can't have that many geometrically. So when we when we, uh, we we when we evaluate this formula, what we actually get is eleven. That corresponds to the maximum number of regions that you can define if you just draw four lines in a piece of paper. You can never get more than eleven. And what's interesting about this bound is that you can always reach this bound. So in the case of shallow networks, we're done. We know exactly what's the maximum number of linear regions that we can obtain. And if we just move the hyperplanes around so that they're not, there are not too many hyperplanes coinciding the same points, then we're done. But for deep neural networks, things are a bit different. When I talk about deep, I'm talking about more than one layer. And I could give you a lot of mathematics, math uh, I could give you a long mathematical explanation about that. Or we can look at the geometry again, but with more layers to understand exactly what is happening. And that's what we're going to do next. Here's a very simple neural network. We have inputs x1 and x2. Then we have a first layer with neurons A and B, second layer with neurons C and D in green, and the third layer with neurons E and F in red. So, and we're going to use, um, and, and you're, you're seeing these lines here, uh, on these plots on the at the bottom. These are the hyperplane, uh, the activation hyperplanes. For example, here we have the activation hyperplane for A. Oh, and we have this arrow pointing at the direction in which A is active. And the same thing for B. Here's the hyperplane of B. 
and the direction in which B is active. Now, let's talk about what happens in terms of the outputs of the first layer. So here is the same graph again. We have, depending on the values of x1 and x2, we're in different regions. Uh, in one of these regions, um, the one on top, A and B are active. In the one in the bottom, A and B are inactive. Now, in terms of the dimension of the output, and this is where things are going to get interesting for us, if A and B are active, it, that means that the output of A and B are positive. So the output of the first layer is going to have two dimensions. Now, let's think about these other linear regions here. Let's say, for example, if we are in this, oh my God, the mouse is not happening here. Let's say if we're in this one dimensional space here, that means that we are in, we're looking at these inputs, x1, x2, that activate A, but they do not activate B, which means that the output coming out of the neuro, of the, this, of the first layer is going to be a positive number for A and a zero for B, which means that the output is in, one is in a one dimensional space. Same thing here, right? If you look at the on the left, this is, a region, this is a region of the input space where B is active, but A is not active. So the output is zero and a positive number. And if you look at the bottom, this is an area where A and B, like the, the affine functions will have negative values. A and B are going to have a zero value coming out. So basically we're shrinking that entire part of the input space to a single point with the first hidden layer. And we're never going to recover from that. So we're just squeezing all the information, like all of those points as the same thing going forward in the neural network. And as I mentioned before, the number of linear regions depends on the number of hyperplanes, so the number of neurons in every layer, and the dimension of um, the dimension of the space in which these hyperplanes are. Now, if we don't, in all of these regions, except the, the, the first, the one on the top, we have fewer dimensions than before. We, we don't have like two dimensions. For in two of them, we have one dimension, and in one of them, we have zero dimension, which means that we don't, we can't partition this, that, those parts of the input space that much anymore. And now there's something very interesting that happens when you think about the linear regions after the, sec, after the second hidden layer. So moving one slide, this is how this looks like. So here on the bottom, we have the hyperplane, the activation hyperplanes for C and D in terms of the outputs in A and B. Now we can put, we can reframe that in terms of the inputs of the neural network. Then C and D will look different across every linear region defined by the first hidden layer. Within every linear region, we're going to have activation hyperplanes. But as we move different between different linear regions, these hyperplanes might be bending around. It's as if you were sending light for different media. So you can see that like C starts going up, then bends a little bit when we get to the two-dimensional region, and then goes down. And same thing with D. And in terms of the output, we're going to have a lot more loss of dimensionality here. So we have lots of linear regions here with a zero dimensional output, which means that we cannot further partition them. They have squeezed to a single point. We have some others where we just have one dimension now because either in the first layer, in the second, or in both, we just have one active neuron, which means that it doesn't matter what happens now, we know that like all the outputs for that particular part of the input space will be contained in a smaller dimensional space. You can think about that as, for example, the dimension of the image of an affine function. And that will keep going on with more and more layers. And one thing that's interesting to notice here is that if, if, we have, if we have a neural network where all the layers have the same width, that implies to us that at most one linear region is going to preserve a full dimensional output. Everywhere else, we're losing dimensions. And well, given that, given that information, given the fact that in most, in most linear regions that are being produced by the sequence of layers, we're, we're being constrained in a smaller and a smaller space. We came up with this theorem uh, in a paper in 2018, 
that is tighter than previous results on the maximum number of linear regions that you can obtain. I'm not expecting you to understand the formula at the first sight, far from that, but I just want to observe that this is tighter than what that then existed before. And interestingly, we found out that this theorem is tight when the input has size one. In that case, this theorem actually tells you the maximum number and like, and we can actually achieve that number. But now, okay, I, I told you, I, I don't want you to fully understand this formula. There is no point for doing that right now in a short talk. But actually what I'm going to do is tell you in practice what this formula means. Let's say that we're on a budget. Let's say that we want to use 60 neurons to define a neural network. And we want to maximize the number of linear regions. What can we do? So here we're going to compare uh, the bound coming from theorem one that I just showed you with the best bound before us, which doesn't leverage for this loss of dimensionality in the same way that we're doing here, which is from a paper from Montufer, 2017. So if we're talking about a shallow neural network, as I mentioned before, in the case of a shallow network, the, the bound is tight and we know the, the value and it's going to be the same for both. Now, if instead of having one layer with 60 neurons, what if we had two layers with 30 neurons each? How is that different with the new bound? So this is what we found out. So the maximum number of linear regions is going to like plateau at the lower level now. And if we, instead of having two layers with 30 neurons, we had three layers with 20 neurons each, this is how it looks. Same thing for four layers and 15, five layers and 12, and six layers and 10. So here on Y, we have the, the upper bound for the maximum number of linear regions. In the case of the red line for the shallow network, this is tight. And here on X, we have the size of the inputs of the neural network, because that defines the space that we're partitioning. So before us, there was this trend of saying that depth usually benefits the number of linear regions. And, and for that reason, the literature on linear regions was basically confirming that deeper, the deeper, the better. But what we found out with this tighter result is that there's a fine line here. So as you can see, like um, a deeper neural network can, um, can produce more linear regions, but that really depends on having um, an input that's sufficiently large. And so, and, so there, and there are two important insights here. The first one is that if the input dimension is very large, shallow networks actually define more linear regions. So because we know that the red line is tight and we can always achieve that. Uh, now we know that, okay, if the input dimension is sufficiently large, if you have more inputs than the number of neurons, then you should definitely have a shallow network if your purpose is maximizing the number of linear regions. But the other way to look at these results is the following. If we fix the input dimension, let's say we have a particular application in mind. Uh, for example, let's say we have an application where the, the input is actually, let's say, something around um, 12. I just draw a line here. We can see that like um, the bound for three layers of 20 neurons, it has a larger value than having fewer or more layers, which means that potentially, if these bonds are tight enough, in that particular case, having a neural network with three layers would be better than having more layers or less layers, which hints that we could potentially use these bounds to tell which would be the right depth given other constraints on how we want to design our neural network. Now, another way that we can look at this entire thing is as a disjunctive program. So every linear region corresponds to a different polyhedron in which, and each one of this, po of this polyhedra is characterized by which units are active or not. For the active units, we basically have the outputs being equal to that affine transformation of the input and that being greater than or equal to zero. And for the units that are not active, we have that a fine transformation smaller than or equal to zero and the output being equal to zero. 
which basically means that in an extended space where we have the inputs of the neural network and the outputs of all the layers, we're always defining polyhedra, which also means that if we just project out the extra variables, these are all polyhedra on X. And the other important thing is, if we can represent this adjunctive program, it also means that we can have a mixed integer programming formulation that can represent a map from input to the output of the neural network. And this is, in fact, disjunctive programming is not something that's mentioned very often, but this is a secret sauce for integer programming solvers, for example. And it's an area that was developed by a former advisor, and, and he passed away um, a couple of years ago, but one of in his last year, he decided to write his book about like everything that he, that he did on the topic. And it's a very mind-opening way of looking at integer programming and also at formulations. And this is one way in which you can find, for example, better inequalities to tighten formulations of lots of different optimization problems. Now, how that applies to us? What we're going to... Sorry. Yeah. So as I mentioned, that means that we can find a mixed integer programming formulation that can map inputs to outputs. And by just counting the number of solutions or the number of different feasible polyhedra of this formulation, we can tell um, we can tell the number of linear regions of a, a trained neural network. Now, where, what I'm going to show here, I, now I'm going to show you some experimental results based on that. So basically, we trained lots of rectifier networks on the MNIST benchmark. The MNIST benchmark are 28 by 28 pictures. Um, and these pictures are handwritten digits and there is like they're labeled. So we can tell whether it's a zero, one, two, three, all the way to nine. And they're all black and white. So it's basically every 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 one of the in this 28 by 28 matrix, every one of the elements is a value between zero and one which is, depends on whether this is closer to black or closer to white in the black and white picture. Now, we trained uh, rectifier networks on the MNIST benchmark with, as I mentioned before, this input 28 by 28. The final layer has 10 units of output so that we can associate probabilities to each one of the digits. And in addition to that, we have two hidden layers summing up to 22 units. And what we try to do here is for every, like we, we try to look at every possible configuration of widths for these layers. For example, the first layer having one neuron, the second layer we're going to have is going to have 21. The first layer having two, the second layer is going to have 20, and so on. And for each one of these configurations, we trained 10 neural networks and we counted the number of linear regions in them. And this is a summary of our results. So here on X, you have these different configurations of neurons in each layer. All the way to the left, you have one neuron in the first layer, 21 in the second. And then as you move to the right, you have more and more neurons in the first layer. And as a consequence, less neurons in the second layer. Now, let's take a look at the bounds. So this dashed line on top of the graph here, this is that bound of two elevated to the number of, neural, of, of, neuro, of neurons in the neural network, which is a bound that doesn't depend on the shape of the neural network. Um, then we have this black line uh, right below it. That's the, bar, the tightest bound before our work from 1 to 4, 2017. And you can see that when, the, when the, two layer, the two hidden layers have about the same number of linear regions, uh, sorry, when the two layers have about the same number of neurons, these bounds are basically the same. And here on red, we have our bound, which comes from theorem one that I mentioned before, this red line. And you can see that it's tighter, it's significantly tighter than the previous bounds. And now the blue dots, they're the average number of linear regions in 10 neural networks trained for each one of these different architectures. And we can see that in some cases, especially, especially, especially on the right of the plot, they're closer to the upper bound that we obtained. But if you look at on the left, they're actually a bit further away from them. And as I promised to you, here is the maximum number of linear regions of a neural network with four, 18, and 10 neurons. And here is the average number of linear regions of a neural network with 18, 
4 and 10. And what's, what is, and as we have, as you may have observed from everything that we discussed, the main driver for this here is the fact that in the, in the network on the left, we have a very narrow layer to start with that is constraining the dimension of the output and we never recover from that. And on the right, we actually, we're preserving the dimensionality of the output in most of the linear regions. And then as a result, we, we end up having a neural network which defines more linear regions. Okay, that's one important aspect of the work, but what's not clear maybe at this point is how does that connect with whether the neural network is going to perform well in practice or not? So here we have a plot of the number of linear regions compared to the training error and the test error of the neural network. As you can see at the first sight, this doesn't look that good. Now, let's just pay a closer attention here. Uh, I'm using the heat scale to represent uh, the number of neurons in the first and in the second layer. So on the left of, the, of this plot, we have these very red points. They're the cases where we have uh, most neuron, very few neurons in the first layer and most neurons in the second. When we move all the way to blue on the other extreme, that's when we have most neurons in the first layer and fewer in the second layer. Now, of course, if we have one layer in the neural network where there are just too many, uh, uh, we, sorry, if we have one layer in the neural network which doesn't have enough neurons, we're, we're going to uh, limit the amount of information we're sending through the neural network, and that is going to damage um, the, the accuracy anyway. But and this is exactly what happens in the most red, the red most and the blue most points here. But if we throw away those, if we just look at the configurations with at least four neurons in the first layer and four neurons in the second layer, so we draw, we remove the extremes, then the picture looks very different. Now we basically have a linear relationship in the log scale that the, that says that the more linear regions you have the lower is your training error, and the lower is your test error, at least in these small neural networks that we tested. And one thing that I didn't mention here, but it's important to observe, and this is what brought us to the second paper in this topic, is that counting these linear regions in practice takes a very long time, because we're basically counting them as, them as, as solutions of a mixed integer linear programming formulation, and the problem with that is that there isn't a lot of work on counting the solutions because when we're talking about integer programming, we're usually talking about finding an optimal solution or a very good solution, but we're definitely never interested in finding all the solutions. But, and, and so when we, when we were counting some of these um, neural networks with the most number of linear regions, even for these small examples, it was taking, in some cases, almost a week of runtime for a single network, like between four and seven days. And while there isn't a lot of work on counting solutions of integer programming formulations, there is substantially, there is substantial amount of work in doing exactly that for satisfiability problems. Those are problems in which you have Boolean variables, true or false, and you have clauses that should be satisfied. And all the work applied to the Boolean satisfiability can be applied back to integer programming. So, and that's what we did. So we started from neural networks, trying to understand how to measure the number of linear regions. We found integer programming as a way to count the number of linear regions. But because counting solutions of integer programming formulations is not well studied, we came back to artificial intelligence to look at what is done in propositional satisfiability. And what we did is we came up with a probabilistic lower bound that approximates the number of linear regions in practice. And those are these curves that you can see on the plot on the left, um, the ones with the dots and the segments. As, and as you can see, like some of them, we're going to get closer and closer to the actual number of linear regions. And on the right, you can see that the, the time it takes is substantially smaller, while in the past, it would take in some times, some cases, more than 100,000 seconds to count the number of linear regions. These approximations that we're obtaining now are all pr produced in less than a thousand seconds. So it's we're having an improvement of at least two orders of magnitude here. 
Now, the other thing that you might be wondering is how does that all relate to overfitting, which is if we have an, um, in machine learning in general, if we have a model that's too expressive, we may actually overfit for the, the data, for the training data, and this might not perform well when we're testing. So one thing I would like to mention here is that, okay, there is this traditional trade-off between training and test in traditional machine learning methods. And, but what, what has been found, at least in sufficiently large neural networks, is that it's often possible to obtain good generalization while having the training error approaching zero, which brought this new theory about overfitting uh, due to Michael Belsky and some, some co-authors, which is that there are two regimes for machine learning models. There's a classic one that we know a lot about, that's the underparameterized regime, where training and test error go down. At some point, the training error keeps going down, but the test error is going to go up because we're incurring some form of, um, I mean, there is, there is some overfitting going on. But what they have observed as well, and there's some empirical validation of that right now, is that if you have an overparameterized regime, where like the models are the models have way more parameters than the samples and everything, you may actually get to a point again where you can minimize the training error and minimize the test error at the same time. It's not always perfect, but this might explain what we are seeing with very large neural networks performing very well in practice. But whether that's the case for in terms of the number of linear regions or not is something that depends on having more work on better approximations that we could apply to larger neural networks. Now, first talk, the first part of this talk was about what makes neural networks expressive. And now, once we know that, okay, there, neural networks can potentially be very large, um, sorry, neural networks can potentially represent very complex functions. But as you have seen when we were comparing the bounds with the numbers in practice, sometimes they're not as expressive as we were hoping them to be. And what that hints is that maybe it's possible that we could, once we train the neural network, represent it using fewer neurons later, just remove things and still obtain the same, neuron, the same function in the end. So basically we're trying to answer the following question here. Let's just take some water. We're wondering if we can find a smaller neural network that represents the same relationship between the input X and the output Y. That would be a holy grail. What if we could remove a layer, remove neurons from the other layers, and still obtain exactly the same mapping from X to Y? That would be what we call a lossless compression, in the same way that this is used for images, for example in the sense that we're going to obtain a smaller neural network and we're not losing anything by doing that because the behavior of the neural network is going to be the same no matter what. And if we want to make this problem easier to solve, we can wonder about finding an equivalent neural network, at least for the inputs that are relevant for a given application. So instead of talking about X in general, we could have X as part of a set capital X. For example, when you're talking about the MNIST data set, which is classically used to train, to, to test new approaches, um, basically every input is between zero and one. So we don't care what happens with the neural network if one of the inputs is negative or if one of the inputs is above one because no, no picture is going to look like that. So, and the way that we're going to approach this, loss, this idea of lossless compression is by identifying what we call stability. Let's say that by looking at the, uh, at the linear regions defined by a neural network, we realized that there is a neuron that's always inactive or always active. When either of these is the case, it means that we can simplify the neural network because those are units are stable. So in terms of definitions, let's say that a unit is stably inactive if no matter what relevant input is sent for the neural network, let's say for example, zero one in the case of the MNIST, the output is always going to be zero. And let's say that a unit is stably active if no matter which, which relevant input is sent for the neural network, the output of that neuron is always going to be the affine transformation and it's always going to be strictly positive. 
So those are two cases in which we can say that the, the, the neuron is stable. And if the neuron is stable, I'm going to show you that there are thing, ways in which we can simplify the neural network while preserving exactly the same function being represented. And that's the, the absence of the nonlinearity of the ReLU uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of that, that max between zero and the affine transformation in the ReLU. So let's say, for example, that we have these units in red and they're stably inactive. If a unit is stably inactive, it means that the unit is producing a zero output no matter what, which means that that output is irrelevant for the neurons that come next. So we can as well remove those connections and remove the neuron, those neurons. Now, let's say that we have a group of stably active units. Let's say we have these three neurons here in the middle layer in green, and that we know that they're stably active. So no matter what is sent for the neural network, they're always going to produce positive values, each one of them. But let's say now that if we just look at the weights of these neurons and we take the rank of them, that rank is true. That means that if, like, if we think about the three neurons as an affine transformation of the previous layer to the next one, the image of this transformation has dimension two, which means that uh, we can define the output of one of these neurons as a function of the output of the other two neurons. And if that's the case, if we just adjust the weights of these two neurons to mimic the effect of the third neuron, we can deactivate that other neuron and remove it from the neural network, which is another way in which we can make the neural network smaller. Now let's look at two extreme examples that could happen as well, because I mean, if we start removing uh, stably inactive and stably, stably active units, we might end up with an empty layer, which would be confusing. So let's say that we end up in a situation where all the neurons in a particular layer are active, stably active. What does that mean? That means that because we don't have the nonlinearity, basically these neurons are doing an affine transformation forever comes through them, that we can remove them if we just rewire the, the layer before it with the layer after it, to produce exactly the same effect on, on the outputs of the neural network. And in that way, we're folding a layer of the neural network. Now, what if we have a layer in which all the units are stably inactive, which is another extreme case, and it's actually a very unlikely one, but just for the sake of covering all the cases, let's see what happens. As I mentioned to you before, it, like, if you have an inactive unit, the output is zero, which means that no matter what input we're sending for the neural network, this layer is producing, the output of this layer is basically a vector of zeros, which means that no matter what input we send for the neural network, we're always going to produce exactly the same output because like the inputs don't matter. And basically in that case, we can collapse the neural network to a single output layer because we're basically modeling a constant function. If the inputs don't matter, if no matter what we send for the neural network, a particular layer is going to be entirely inactive, it means that we can simply have a constant function. And this is basically what happens when we're in a zero dimensional region, in, as we were talking before in terms of the linear regions. It's basically a part of the input space where no matter what happens, the output is always going to be the same. Now, this mapping from inputs to outputs, so, as so far, I, told, I have told you what we can do if we can identify that the neurons are stably active and stably inactive, but I haven't told you how to determine that they're stably active or stably inactive, which actually brings us back to the question of how can we formulate uh, optimization problems on neural networks? Because this is going to be important for us now. So here we're going to briefly cover how we can formulate a mapping of inputs to outputs of a neural network. So for a particular neuron, I in layer L, what we can do is we can pick the affine transformation of the inputs, which is used for the ReLU by the ReLU, and equate that to this variable G, which is going to be is going to be our pre-activation output. Now we're going to equate G to the output of the of the neuron minus the output of a complementary fictitious neuron. It's just basically a neuron that is active when the actual one is not. In addition, like both of these neurons have to have a non-negative output. 
And now we're going to plug this binary variable telling whether the neuron is active or not, which is going to constrain the output of the neuron and of its, of its complement. Now, it's easy to understand this formulation if you talk about um, if we talk about it graphically. So here's basically what, we're, uh, what I'm saying. We have this pre-activation output G. So it's basically what happens with the fine transformation. If G is negative, we want the output of the, of the neural network to be zero. If G is positive, we want the output of the neural network to be exactly G. Which, so the way we accomplish that is by having this binary variable Z being equal to zero when um, g is negative, and in that case, the output h is 0. And the binary variable z becomes 1 when, the, when g is positive, and in that case, g equals h. That's basically what we're doing uh, with that formulation from the previous slide. Which brings us now to how we can identify stable units. What we can do is we can try to maximize and minimize this variable G, the pre-activation output. So if we maximize G for a particular neuron, subject to the, the mapping of inputs and outputs of all the neurons before it, and the domain of and the domain of the, of the neural network, and in solving this optimization problem, we find a negative value. That means that we, the, this neuron can never be active because the maximum value of G is negative which means that the neuron is stably inactive. So, and we actually don't have to solve this problem to optimality. If we can find a negative upper bound, that suffices, we're done. Likewise, if we minimize the value of G, like we're trying to send, it, we're trying to send a, uh, an input for the neural network, such that G is going to have the smallest possible value. And if in that case, G is still positive, it means that the neuron is never inactive, so the, the unit, the, the neuron is stably active. And in this case as well, we don't need an optimal solution. If we have a post, positive lower bound for this optimization problem, we're done. And in both of these cases, we basically, we can use mixing to linear programming solvers to determine whether the units are stable or not by just solving this pair of optimization problems. Now, when are we going to see stability happening in practice? It's not going to be all the time. Whenever we talk about compression of neural networks, the, the only way in practice, the way that we can find compression is by inducing it somehow, in the way we train the neural network or by how we are analyzing it. So here are two ways in which we can achieve it. The first one is if we're talking about a restricted domain. So instead of talking about a global stability, we're talking about a local stability. And as I mentioned before, that's the case in applications that we're interested. If it doesn't matter for us any input which is not between zero and one for, for the MS data set, we can restrict our domains and that's going to help us find stable um, stability more often. And the other way in which we can favor that is by inducing sparsity in the parameters. If for example, we use a regularization on the weights, just trying to push the value of the weights down in comparison to the value of the bias, um, this is going to imply that if the bias is positive, the neuron tends to be active. If the bias is negative, the neuron tends to be inactive. If the weight doesn't drive, like if, if the weights in most of the neurons don't drive the, uh, the values the other way around. Now, here's some results um, that we obtained in practice. So in this case here, what we did is we trained 31 neural networks with two hidden layers and 10 units of output on the MNIST. First, I'm going to show you results for the layer width of 25. So those are neural networks with 25, 25, and 10 neurons. And here we're varying the amount of regularization. At the bottom, we're just not using regularization to push the weights down. And as you can see, uh, we can't get any compression out of it because the units are not stable. Now, we, then we, we started increasing the regularization to a point where that where like adding regularization improves accuracy. So just a natural process that happens, like adding some regularization improves accuracy in your networks. And what's interesting is for the amount of regularization that improves accuracy, we can also remove some of the neurons, which is great. And then we also push it even further. Like we just multiplied by five that amount of regularization. And that's the first row here. 
But okay, now accuracy went down because we're just putting too much regularization. But in that case, we can compress the neural network even more. Now, if we look at a layer width of 50, we see exactly the same thing going on. As we start increasing the regularization, compression goes up as well. And like we can find a sweet spot where we have a more accurate model during training and we can compress it afterwards, which means that we can even make it smaller than without regularization. And the same thing for 100 neurons. And what we actually notice with the larger the neural networks get is that the compression increases. But also, and that's a bit unfortunate, the runtime to obtain the compressed neural network identifying all these stable neurons grows very fast as well. And that's where we're, we're, we're putting our efforts now on like finding ways to reduce the time to solve these problems. So, okay, that's a summary of what I had to say. Um, the first part of this talk is based on these two papers on top, ICML 2018 and AAAI 2020. The second part of the talk is based on this paper pre presented at CPIOR 2020. There is also a preprint with some extra results on archive. And if you want to take a look at the big, bigger picture in more detail, there is this blog post um, that I wrote called My Neural Network is a Piecewise Near Function, but which one? And you can find a bit more information about these connections there. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I, I am here if you have any questions about, about the presentation. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, you Chow, you asked how you can how the bound is calculated in the example. So if I'm understanding it correctly, you're referring this is in the first part of these slides. So you're talking about this bounds here, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so here we're basically uh, applying this recursive formulation here. And I think what you can think here is that uh, if we were talking about a single layer, it's basically um, this formula that we obtained before, right? Now, the, now and, and let's say, for example, that like these are the linear regions defined by the first layer. In each one of these linear regions, and actually we have a better example here, in each one of these linear regions, we know how many neurons are active in that layer. What, uh, what, what the formula in the theorem does effectively is, okay, now for every one of these small, of these linear regions here, we're going to recursively apply that same formula again. But in each one of them, we're going to use, um, instead of, of using the width of the previous layer as the, the dimension of the space, we're going to use the maximum number of active neurons. So in, one of, in the second layer here, we're going to use two as the dimension in one linear region. We're going to use one in two linear regions, and we're going to use zero, zero in the other linear region. In that way, we're obtaining a smaller bound than it would be possible, than people would calculate in the past. It's basically a recursive application of that formula, but just by observing that for every one of the linear regions previously defined, uh, we have to find what's the smallest number of active neurons in any layer leading to that linear region. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. So I have another question about this, the page 21. You can see that, can you explain the third picture in page 21? Okay, the third, third picture. 
Uh, wh what would be the third picture here? This, this, oh, yeah, I, I'm just, it's not clear to me what would be the third picture. Uh, so wait a moment. Um, I think it's the top, uh, the top uh, rightmost one. Oh, this one. Is that right? Uh, no, no, top right. Uh, this is the top left, right? So the, the top right one. Mm, I. I, I don't understand what picture <laughs> you're talking about. Um, so you're talking about this one here, uh, the one on the left. Uh, the top right, the, the top right, the top right. Top right, the third one, uh, the next, yeah, this one. This one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is just continuing the same idea. So. Basically, um, just go some steps back. So the first um, the first linear regions are defined in the input space x1, x2. Um, the linear regions of the second hidden layer, they are they're defined in terms of the outputs of the first hidden layer. That's what we see in the bottom with C and D as hyperplanes. But when we think about them in terms of the inputs of the neural network, then, um, so we could think is that like in every one of these, um, let me try to draw again, although like my mouse is not really helping. It's as if in each one of these, um, oops, each, in each one of these uh, quadrants here, we're producing outputs, right? For example, here we have like A and B being positive, And then we like, we're trying to apply C and D on top of it. And that's how we're producing this um, these hyperplanes again. But for example, if we're talking about just I mean, I, I just connect another mouse here to explain this in a little more detail. Okay, now it's going to be easier. Just clear this. So basically, if we think, for example, about this area here, A and B, right? Um, this is producing, uh, like, here is, like, the origin again. And, like, A grows in this direction. And B grows in this, like, A is, like, we're going to have a vector, like, where A is here. And B is here. And this is going to produce values. And then like we can, and so we, we can, and by just finding the right values for A and B, we can draw exactly these hyperplanes for C and D in terms of the original space, which is what we do here. Now that's, that's simpler, but uh, let's start over now with one of the other, with one of the other linear regions. Let's say now that we have um, this linear region here, this is a linear region where A grows, but B is always zero, which means this, that this is a space where basically like, um, this is a space where the value of A is going to grow. Let's say here is A equals one, A equals two, A equals three, and so on. But the value of B is always zero. Which means that, okay, we know that like after a certain threshold, um, the value of A alone is going to activate neuron C. And later, more here, like the value of A alone with B equals zero is going to activate D, right? And like, and that's what we're observing here. Oh, sorry, on the other side. No, no, actually, it's this side, sorry. <laughs> um, let me just rephrase this. Uh, 
And basically, as I mentioned before, B is always zero here. So the value of B is not changing. So the value of A alone is defining this line. And that's why these lines are parallel to one another and they look different than um, the lines defined for C and D in the other linear region. It's basically for every piece that we produce in the, with the first hidden layer, we're applying now, uh, we, we, we convert uh, this to the space of the second hidden layer so that we can tell what, where exactly the hyperplanes would be. And then we can put them back in terms of the first one. And then for the third, uh, for the third, um, and that's exactly the same thing that happens when we move on to the next one. Now we're basically further partitioning um, the neural network by just applying the, the hidden, um, by, by just applying the hyperplane arrangements of E and F within each, each one of the linear regions defined by the previous two layers. And within each one of them, we're going to have uh, hyperplanes. But as we move between these different uh, parts of this space, these hyperplanes will change because sometimes A is zero, B is zero, C is zero, or D is zero. So those, those inputs will not affect what happens that part of the input space anymore. It's a bit tricky in the beginning, but it's kind of a beautiful geometry once you start like paying attention for a little longer. Um, so basically in the third image, uh, there are uh, like in total 11 um, hyperplanes, right? Yeah, right. Okay, that's tricky. It's tricky to say how many hyperplanes we have. In terms of linear regions here, we have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, I lost track now, but this is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, because you have the, the number 11, uh, like in the previous uh, slide. So oh is, no! Uh, oh, but that is a very different it? example. Oh no! Okay. That, oh no! That 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 was a very different example. Um, so the main point is just that it's always very hard to move to like more uh, examples with more dimensions. But in that previous in that previous slide, that's um, let's go back there and make sure that this, we're in the same page. So. We can think about this as an example where we have one, let me draw again here. We have one a hidden layer, one layer in the neural network with just four neurons. And that's it, nothing else. There are two inputs, let's say X1 and X2. And X1 and X2 are processed by like these four neurons. And this is what is going to produce the outputs of the neural network, right? So we can think that every one of these neurons is breaking the space into two halves, halves, right? We can think, okay, the first neuron comes here and breaks the input that way. The second neuron breaks the input this way. The third neuron is here. The fourth neuron is there. And then we want to count how many different regions we can obtain. The, the most important, point of this slide is that instead of two elevated to four, because we're having with every neuron, because we're in a space which is not that um, big, like we just have two dimensions, we can actually only draw 11 regions. Like in total here, we just have 11 regions. We can never get more than 11. It's just to say that the number, the, the dimension of this space is very important in telling you how many linear regions we are going to obtain. Now, when we go to the other example, it's even simpler. In that, in the next slide, the example that we're using there has, let's say, if we're talking about um, two dimensions and we have two um, and we have two neurons, we can break that into four pieces, which is great. But if, for example, let's move to the next slide to make it easier to understand. Um, if we're talking, for example, about one of these parts where we just have one active neuron. Let's say if we talk here about this region of the space where only A is active. If only A is active, basically we're mapping 
everything here to a line with A. How can you break a line where only A with only A with two neurons? Well, you can cut it once, you can cut it twice, right? Which means in total you can have three linear regions. But if you're talking about one line, there is no way you can use two uh, cuts to get four segments out of it. That's where the dimension starts affecting us. And if we're talking about this region here, where we lost all the dimensions, I mean, this is a point, right? A and B equals zero. There's nothing we can do. Like, there is no way we can draw a line that's going to split this into two pieces. Because either, like, this is going to be on one side or the other or containing the hyperplane. And because of that, we can't further partition. That's why, th that's the main uh, intuition for why we obtained a stronger bound, which is you just can't partition that much anymore because you lost dimensions. So here we're not losing dimensions. We have two dimensions, so we can continue having like four pieces coming out of it. So if we just look one slide further, you can see here that in the part of the space where we have two dimensions in the output from the previous layer, we're obtaining four linear regions, right? We have a combination of C and D on and off. But in the parts of the input space where we have just one dimension, as I mentioned before, it's as if we were we have a line and we want to partition that line with 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 some with some hyperplanes. We can only have three. So we can see that here we have four because the dimension is true. Here we have only three because the dimension of the input is one. And here at the bottom we have one because there is no way we can cut a point into two pieces, right? I mean, there, there is that, 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 that is, that's a, something you cannot do anymore. And if we keep moving, if we go to the next partitioning, we're going to see exactly the same thing. There is, okay, there is this one linear region here with two dimensions, with two dimensions. We can see that in this part of the space, we could produce four new linear regions. Now, in the other parts of the input space, we can't produce that much. And we, even, we may produce even less. Like for example, in this part here, uh, only F is here. So I mean, instead of three, we're actually producing two. Same thing here, like on, on this side between D and A, we only have, have E coming through. So this is a part where we have four, here we have one, here we have one. And that's why sometimes we, we have less than the bound because we're like, there's just no way that we're going to partition every linear region with all the hyperplanes. I hope that gives some light on what I said. If not, please let me know. Yes, yes uh, thank you. I think we will know, yeah. So it has another problem, so you can see the chat. Okay, so training the neural network. Um, we are just doing gradient descent as normally done. Uh, the whole purpose of the integer programming formulation is once you have your neural network, the neural network is already trained. You have the weights and the biases, you know everything about it. We just want to maximize the outputs of the neurons subject to how the neural network looks like. We're solving an optimization problem just to determine if the neurons are stable or not. We don't change the weights or the bias anymore. Those are given. So everything we're doing here is with trained neural networks already. So uh, I have a question about this. So you treat, uh, you just trained the neural network and you didn't uh, change anything of the model? Yes. So uh, in the first part of the talk, I don't change anything. In the second part of the talk, when we're talking uh -huh. about compressing the neural network, 
Yeah. Then we change the model, but we change the model later. Um, it's not like um, once we we have the trained in neural network, then we're solving the integer programming problems mm -hmm. just to determine which units are stable. And once we have solved those, okay, now we know that some neurons are stable, other neurons are not. Then yeah. we change. But this we change after solving the optimization problems. Uh, okay, I see what you mean. Thank you. It's basically a post-processing of what was of the neural network, right? You can think, okay, like we're just adding something on top of it. Okay, thank you. There is no more no more questions. So thank you for your time. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, this has been very interesting. I never give it. I have never given a seminar in China. Oh yeah. Thank you. I wish so I could be there in person, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is no. not a, a very convenient for now. So thank you very much and keep in touch. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye. Ni hao. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Keep in touch. Bye bye. Bye.